Well, hi there. I want to show you how you can use a Zoom F8 recorder, which is sitting right up here, as a preamp and interface between a turntable and a computer. Didn't know you could do that, huh? Or maybe you did. I don't know. <laughs> At any rate, we'll show you how to do that because there's a little more to it than meets the eye. But does it do a good job? Oh, I wouldn't be here if it didn't. So let's, let's go. All right, here is the Zoom F8. It's presently turned off. I've got it connected to a, a, an amp here, which is not necessary. You can listen through the, um, through the speakers in your computer, but um, if you have one, then you can do that as well. So you can listen that way. Here's what you're going to have to do to get it all hooked up. Starting over here, you want to make sure that you've got the little USB cable that comes with it. And it's plugged in to the USB port, which is easier said than done, <clears throat> right there. On the back, I've got, I've got the power cord just the regular little AC adapter. You can power it any old way, it doesn't matter. The other thing, I've got the two uh, mini XLRs connected around behind into the power amp for monitoring purposes. But like I said, you won't need that if you just wanna listen through the computer itself. Here's the important part. What we've got here is a regular, um, what do you call that? A quarter inch phone, phone plug. Um, and on the other end of it is the little RCA phono plug. And that's plugged into the back of the turntable. It will depend on your particular turntable what's there, but um, some of them have phono jacks on the back where you can put the little RCA plug. Some are hardwired, but ultimately you need to come out of the out of the turntable with two quarter inch phone plugs monaural ts types tip and sleeve the and it's important that you have two one for each channel and what you're going to do is plug them into two of the mic inputs on the Zoom F8. I'm using channels five and six just simply because they're on the side over there where the, where the cable's coming from, and that made it easier. And uh, five is gonna be the uh, left channel and six will be the right channel, so you may need to, uh, to do some twiddling about that. All right, let's turn it on, and I'll show you what you gotta do to make it, make it work. Um, first thing you want to do is activate channels, the, the two channels that you've got the uh, turntable connected to. And in this case, well, let's see, get this off. Well, I get it here in a minute. All right. <laughs> Sorry about all the fumbling. With, with the Zoom, if you activate a track, then it's just a solo track all by itself. Um, but in this case, what we're really looking for is a stereo output. So what you want to do is press 5 and 6 at the same time. And notice 6 went blank and 5 and 6 are together over here. Now, the two volume controls are going to be, uh, everything else should be down, are going to be more or less the same, but you may discover that, that it requires a little tweaking. One's going to need a couple dB more than the other in order for things to be balanced. But at any rate, that's that. So <clears throat> that's all you got to do. Set five and six or whatever two you're using together as a stereo pair. And then you can adjust the volume directly. Notice that I've got it at about two-thirds of the way up. So it's got plenty of gain. It can handle it, no problem. <clears throat> now the last thing you have to do is hit your menu and come down to the very bottom to USB and push the button, 
come down to audio interface, push the button, and choose the very first thing, which is a stereo mix for PC or Mac. You also have the choice of sending it to an iPad or you can have each of the eight tr uh, channels on here go as discrete channels uh, into your PC or Mac. But for our purposes, for transferring a record, either stereo or mono, it does not matter, we want it on stereo mix. So you hit that and now you're done. And now the computer is ready to accept it as an audio interface. Okay, now you know how to set up the Zoom F8 to act as an amplifier preamp for the turntable and as an interface into the computer. At this point, let's mention, we're not going into detail about it, but let's mention the software. The software is critical. Um, and there's a feature in this particular software that is absolutely vital to the success of this project. Uh, I, I can't tell you about a lot of different uh, recording options with various computers. This is a Mac. But I think, I'm pretty certain, that this program, this application, is available for both Macs and PCs. I think it actually started out on PCs. And it's called Vinyl Studio. And I recommend it. It works. It's got some wonderful features, and I'm going to get into those in a minute. Some of the features include making it easy for you to enter all the information about your record, and if you're lucky, it can look it up for you and enter a lot of that information without you having to type it in. It makes it easy to break things up into tracks. It's got automation on the recording, so once the phonograph stops, the recording will stop within a few seconds after that. So you can leave it unattended. That, that's a big deal because, you know, these things take a while to transfer. So that's on the upfront side. In the post-processing side, that's where it really gets interesting. It has the usual features for, uh, you know, adjusting volumes and things like that, but it, it has a declicker that works better than I think any I have ever seen, and I've seen a lot of them, and it, it really works very well. And let's face it, your records are going to have some clicks and ticks and pops. Uh, if you're so inclined, you'll get your best results if you clean the record first. If you have a, one of those wonderful machines that will do it, then God bless you. But if you don't, there are other methods. All of them are covered in great and just excruciating detail on the Internet. So go to YouTube and look for Cleaning LP. I will tell you this. One of the methods that's talked about a lot is using... Believe it or not, if you haven't heard about this, you won't believe it. It's Elmer's Wood Glue or any other brand, <clears throat> tight bond or something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me, wood glue. And you put it on in a thin coating on the record. Don't get it on the label. Just coat the record evenly. Let it dry for a while and then peel it off while it's still rubbery. And will it clean the record? You, you will not believe it. It will clean it unbelievably well. I had great success. But then I did it again, and I used, I guess, I don't know if I used too much or what, but I left it on there too long, and it wouldn't come off. And I ruined a record that way. Fortunately, it was not valuable. So, you know, experiment with, with uh, you know, bargain bin stuff that doesn't really matter. The method works. I'm not sure if it's worth it. Um, honestly, when you clean them with this, you're going to wonder if any cleaning method's worth it. So anyway, Vinyl Studio it does that. Now, here is, if you get nothing else out of this except two things. One, the Zoom F8 works great as an interface and preamp for a turntable. The second thing is this. When records are recorded, and this goes back to the days of 78s, possibly even, no, it wouldn't go back to Edison's, but it goes back to 78s, and electrical 78s. The, the recording engineers discovered that when, when you were playing bass notes, any kind of low frequency information, it causes the 
stylus, the cutting stylus, to move more widely. Making something louder will make it move more widely. But the bass frequency has more energy in it. Our ear, it's just to compensate for our hearing. <clears throat> we don't hear in a linear fashion, and therefore what we think is a normal bass has actually got more energy in it than the mid-range and treble. Uh, another reason why loudspeaker systems are so big, it's just for the bass part. Okay. Anyway, normal bass frequencies cause the stylus to move very wide. That took up real estate, which equaled time. And their goal was to get, you know, well, as much as four or five minutes on a single 78 and on an LP up to about 20 minutes on a side. <clears throat> well, if you had these wide grooves, you couldn't do that. Hello? <laughs> and, uh, bloop, well, we're back. We got that resolved. Uh, the uh, wide grooves take up real estate. So they discovered, well, why don't we just turn down the bass when we're recording the record? When we're actually cutting the disc. We'll, we'll just roll off the bass. It'll be it'll be rolled off. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If if you had flat like so, then your bass see would be downhill like that. So the bass is rolled off. And then when they play it back, well, let's add in something that will boost it. We'll have a a tone control that's built into the system, it's fixed, and it will add back as much as this takes out. And so the net result is a flat, a flat curve. And that was wonderful, and it really worked well, and that got rid of the uh, problem of too much real estate being used by the, by the wide grooves. The other problem with, with records is the noise factor. The, the surface of the record itself makes a certain amount of noise, a kind of a hissing, especially on the old 78s. <clears throat> but you have tape hiss and things like that. Crackles and ticks and pops and such as that are generally composed of very high frequency components. That's the part we hear the most. They may have a lot, but the wide, the high frequency is what we really hear. So the engineers thought, well, if we did that with a bass, what if, what if we boosted the treble when we record it, and then when we play it back, we'll reduce it, and the, the music, the sound will come down flat, but the noise will be pushed on down further, and it won't be as obvious. So... You had this curve right here, this curve, I'm sorry, this curve right here, which boosts the travel. This is the playback curve over here. And so any kind of a phonograph preamp, and this goes back to your old 78s and your record players and so forth, built into them is a tone control that boosts the bass and reduces the treble so that the net result is flat. And I'm telling you this, and it's very important, because if you record straight from your turntable through a mic preamp that does not have that curve in it, then what you're going to get is a recording that sounds very thin. It won't have a lot of bass. Bass been rolled off, remember? And it's going to be very bright because the treble has been boosted. So we need a way to flatten it out. The software has built-in curves. And in, oh, I don't know, maybe with the advent of the LP and around that 1948 or 9, the Record Industry Association of America settled on a standard curve because up until then every manufacturer had his or her own idea of how it should be and they were all similar but they were all different so they came out with that and it was called the riaa equalization curve and by 1954 virtually everyone had adopted it so if you buy an lp that was produced after 1954 
chances are good it'll be it'll have that RIAA curve. Now, that's available here. That's the standard. But they also have 75 to 100 more to match up to other recordings made in Europe and here, and they're done by different labels. Columbia Records alone had five or six different curves. So you can experiment with that when you're doing it. <clears throat> but the point being that when you record it with the F8, you're recording flat. So you're going to get the record as the engineers did it on the original cutting with rolled off bass and boosted highs. And so it's going to sound terrible. Don't worry. Don't panic. Just keep going. And after you've processed everything, after you've done your clicks and so forth, then you apply your RIAA curve. Friends, it sounds good. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, it really, it really, really does. So that's it. Um, I mean, I can demonstrate it for you, but you know, that, that's just going to be putting on a turntable. And by the way, that's a that's a Thorin's turntable. It's it's uh, nice. I got it a few years ago. It was made in the '60s in Switzerland, and I got it. Um, I actually bought it from a friend here in town. Oh, I don't know, 20 years ago now. But um, and it's got a good cartridge. But you can get turntables now, man. I mean, there there there's a market in turntables and. Uh, and so forth. It's great. Now, this is not to say that you can't buy a dedicated um, little preamp with a USB output and plug it in there and avoid all that. But this is a great preamp in here, and it sounds clean. It's really good. And by recording it flat like that, you have the ability in the software to put in all those different curves. Try them out. You click, 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 click. Just go through, find one. You may discover, you know, that sounds better this way or that. And then there are a lot of other features in there too. So the software is important. The hardware is important. It's all important and it's all fun. Good luck with it. Talk to you later.